Welcome to this service of worship for January 31st, 2021. Hard to believe that the first month of the new year has already gone by. This video is coming to you from the Princeton University Chapel, and we are so glad that you could join us. At the website where you access this video is a printed bulletin for this service. I encourage you to refer to that so that you may better follow along and learn more about our chapel community. We hope that you and all whom you love and care for are healthy and living as well as possible in these challenging times. Please hear this call to worship. 
Let us gather together our scattered selves and be present together before our God right now. Isolation, seclusion, or quarantine can constrain our physical lives, but never our spirits. Let us send them soaring now to meet the Holy Spirit, who graces all of our days and all of our ways. With gladdest hearts, let us worship God. Our first reading comes from Psalms 111. Praise God. I will give thanks to God with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of God, studied by all who delight in them, full of honor and majesty in God's work and God's righteousness endures forever. God has gained renown by God's wonderful deeds. God is gracious and merciful. God provides food for those who fear God and is ever mindful of God's covenant. God has shown God's people the power of God's works and giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of God's hands are faithful and just. All of God's precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. God sent redemption to God's people and has commanded God's covenant forever. Holy and awesome is God's name. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. God's praise endures forever. Here ends this reading. Our second reading comes from the book of 1 Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrifice to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. 
Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. But anyone who loves God is known by God. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Creator, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one God, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, whoever, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it's weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their failing, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Here ends this reading. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Over the last 10 months, we've become mindful of our shopping, grocery shopping. No longer do we make frequent and unnecessary trips to the grocery store for this or that. Now it's the complete opposite. Grocery shopping has become an exercise in planning and meal prep. That includes searching the World Wide Web for recipes. Recipes for everything from the quarantine standard bread to interesting things like homemade vegan chocolate tofu ice cream. Yes. However, one recipe search often leads to another and before I know it, I've read a dozen articles debating the health benefits and the hazards of tofu, alkaline versus tap water, and the top 10 reasons why I should switch to green tea. Today we find ourselves several links and clicks into Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. Paul is familiar with the circumstances and the people in Corinth because he helped start this congregation. However, while away on one of his many missionary journeys, he receives word from Chloe that there are problems, big problems. This new community and congregation of Christians just can't seem to get on one accord. There are deep divisions, ugly words at meetings, parking lot plotting, and clicks. If you've ever been in any kind of new anything with other people, you know exactly what this is like. Thus, in an attempt to restore order and unite the people, Chloe reaches out to Paul, and Paul responds with a detailed letter. Like a coach in the locker room when the losing team is down at halftime, Paul gives them a pep talk. He begins by reminding them of their love for God and their commitment to follow Jesus Christ. He addresses how to handle conflict, the importance of maturity. He even gives guidance on personal matters, such as intimacy in marriage, 
the benefits of singleness, and the possible complexities of divorce. And meet. He responds to the question, can Christians eat meat that has been sacrificed to, idol, to idols? This is an important question for first century Christians because back then you received meat from two places, the market or the temple. In the supermarket, the prices were higher because this meat was, let's say, organic and free range. While the temple had an abundance of used meat, the meat in the temple had been used for sacrifices to idols and gods, and thus it was plentiful and way cheaper. The Christians who were strong in their faith had no problems eating the temple meat because they attached no significance to the idol gods, and they understood that the food was not contaminated. However, there were those who had concerns. The text refers to them as weaker, but let's say they were mindful eaters who expressed concern regarding where that meat had been and what it had been used for, and they were not comfortable with consuming meat that had been offered to idols. Each group. Each group had strong opinions about their dietary preferences. And I bet there were many first century blog posts, websites, and articles written on the topic. We may be tempted to trivialize this chapter with its 13 verses about meat, but it's actually relevant to the issues and questions Christians ask today about a number of issues. Abortion, climate change, consuming alcohol, veganism, gender identity and sexual orientation, the accumulation of money, shopping at big box stores, getting delivery service, politi political engagement, race, nationalism, just to name a few. Paul doesn't respond with a cut and dry answer. He, he doesn't give any dogma nor declaration of who's right and who's wrong. Yet he writes, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. You see, for Paul, having knowledge is not enough. Knowledge is not enough because information, facts, and figures alone can cause pride and arrogance. Knowledge, even the access to a certain type of knowledge, cannot be the only factor. Nor does having knowledge about a matter mean that the issue is settled. Knowledge alone can lead to actions and decisions that can cause harm. Knowledge alone can never be the goal. For Paul, knowledge must be balanced with love. It is knowledge and love that leads to better understanding and compassion. It is knowledge and love that reorients our thinking from the individual to the communal, and not just my community, but God's beloved community. In his response, Paul says, just because it doesn't bother you doesn't mean it's not a stumbling block for someone else. Just because we have the freedom or the right to, should we? Just because it's not your child in a failing school system or just because your home is not in a food desert or your loved one did not die from COVID or you won't be around for the next 100 years so I don't really care about the impact of climate change doesn't mean it's not your or our responsibility. For Paul, knowledge must be balanced with love, and my friends, love is a verb. From knowledge to action is an invitation for us to love with our very lives and the choices that we make in our lives on a daily basis. For God so loved the world that God sent us Jesus and Jesus died by state sanctioned execution because of his radical love for us. 
There is a quote that is often attributed to the late, great Maya Angelou. When you know better, you do better. When you know better, you do better. When I hear this quote, I doubt if Mother Maya's knowing is grounded in piety and self-righteousness. I imagine that her newfound knowledge is the doorway to grace for oneself. The doorway through which we walk and we repent, turn away from the old and instead take our knowing and go in a new direction with love. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? God, our creator, may we be discerning of your will, confident in your character, and have integrity in our actions, that as we begin to know better, we do better. Help us to hold one another accountable in love as we experience the actions of new leadership as news of racial justice seems to fade from the front page, and we are left to, own, to our own devices to bring change. Help us to build each other up. Guide us not only in knowledge, but also in action. Be with us as we begin to approach a year of being in a pandemic, that we may continue loving our neighbor as we may become almost numb to the urgency we face. Be with those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, of companionship, of community, and guide us so that we may become and come alongside one another with care. Today, I pray for the renewing of hope, that change is coming and ask that you inspire new creativity in each of us. I pray these things with the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now would you join me in our prayer for Princeton. O oh, eternal God, the source of light and light for all peoples, we pray you would endow this university with your grace and wisdom, give inspiration and understanding to those who teach and to those who learn, grant vision to its trustees and administrators, to all who work here and to all who bear her name. 
Give your guiding spirit of sacrificial courage and loving service. Amen. Hear now this benediction. Friends, go into this week balancing knowledge and love. May knowledge move us to action and may grace and peace keep us from being a stumbling block along the way to God's all-encompassing love. Amen. <laughs>